again, but here I am. <laughs> <laughs> never say never. Okay, it's now o'clock. Let's let's get ready. All by ready, right? I think so. You have to give me my screen back, though. No, oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Hello. Uh, uh, good morning, and uh, also good morning to American colleagues, and good afternoon to our European colleagues, and good evening to our Asia, the Chinese colleagues. And uh, so, welcome you again to this World a Lot River and the Delta System Source to Sink webinar series. Today, we get Professor Bob Ella from Stony Brook give us talk about the carbon process, mineralization, and the weathering process um, for tropical deltas. And before I introduce Bob, I would like to mention next week, next Wednesday, we have Pete Tolling from University of Durham at the UK. He, as we all know, he's the expert of the Kenyan turbidity current study. He will give us a kind of like a global test site, the detailed direct monitoring. I think it will be very interesting. He told me he would talk about Monterey Bay, the Congo, and many other Kenyan system and some proposal for future studies. And also, Dave DeMaster, and I tried to find a good figure this morning, and but my walk, my walk, early morning walk took too much time. I didn't get time, but I just put a very simple one. So that's to make you, you have to come back next Friday and join Dave's talk. He will talk about radio chemistry and how we use this tool to understand the fluid dynamics, how much offshore, you know, shelf water coming to the near shore area and uh, the sedimentary process, the major delta system, Amazon, Mekong, Yangtze, and Antarctic. Okay, so uh, um, next week, uh, next Wednesday and Friday, we have two more talks. and. Uh, Bob, you know, uh, uh, he graduated uh, from Rochester and got a master and a PhD from Yale University. And then all the way get a faculty position in University of Chicago from assistant professor to full professor, then jump a boat and uh, 1986 to Stony Brook all the way until now. He's a distinguished professor in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Science over there. And Bob is, uh, you know, he studied the sedimentary body chemistry, um, focused on all the way from low latitude to high latitude. Today he talked about tropical delta, as we, but uh, his study crossed all the way from low to high latitude asteroids. And uh, so I didn't find a Google Scholar page because maybe his citation too high, the Google Scholar cannot host that. But I did find that, that you know, the reset gate and indicate his uh, citation is uh, almost 20. I guess it's more than 20, but the uh, reset gate tended to be give a low number. So it's a very good uh, scientist, a very accomplished scholar. So Bob, I think now is uh, it's your turn. Uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Please okay. share your screen and put a presentation mode. I'm getting there. Good. Okay, let me get rid of my stack of people here. Okay. And... You're ready to go. Okay, thanks, Paul. I'm uh, very pleased to, to uh, try to present a sort of a summary of our work in tropical delta systems. And I'm gonna particularly emphasize their system behavior rather than uh, local behavior, which is the tradition in diagenetic studies. So I wanna acknowledge right up front uh, that what I talk about here, and uh, I, in fact, what I talk about in any case is often the function of multiple collaborators as well as myself. And I just want to acknowledge that for what I'm talking about today, there's a whole slew of different people that at different times have contributed greatly to, uh, to the data that I'll be presenting. Now, I, I put this in to not only illustrate, and I know most of you are quite familiar with this type of diagram, and to not only illustrate 
the boundary inputs, the global scale boundary inputs of river material to the oceans, uh, which show also in this figure, the areas that I'll be talking about in particular, the Amazon area and uh, the Gulf of Papua and Papua New Guinea, but also to remind me that I got into this business because of John Milliman, you know, who I collaborated with in the late 70s and early 80s on studies of the East China Sea and the Changjiang River system. Of course, much more has been done since then, and I'll refer to some of that a little bit later. But uh, I just wanted to acknowledge John's role in getting me into this subject area. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, you can see here are the magnitudes of sedimentary input from different regions. And the material that's brought in as a result of these uh, boundary conditions is processed in the ocean and moves uh, on into the continental margins, of course. Now, one of the views of these, uh, of the, the reactions that occur in sediments and occur as a result of these boundary inputs that is tr quite traditional in sedimentary biogeochemistry is a sort of one dimensional view that represents a compilation of each of these points representing local studies, local diagenetic calculations of carbon remineralization. In this case, here's sedimentary carbon oxidation rates and units of millimoles per meter squared per day. And here's depth along this axis. And quite typically, uh, when we discuss these topics, we view everything from the standpoint of a shore perpendicular uh, type of pattern in remineralization rates. And I've circled up here the sort of range of, of uh, remineralization that we find in uh, many delta systems, particularly the tropical systems I'll be talking about today. Oops, sorry. So uh, actually what I want to really emphasize here in this talk is the fact that we tend to look at local areas and accumulate them in the way that I just referred to. But in fact, these are systems which introduce material into the ocean, some of which moves on into deeper water, some of which hugs the coastline in longshore transport as uh, shown here for several uh, dominantly Asian, obviously Asian systems from a paper by Paul here in the in about 2009. So I wanna talk about these systems. What are the systems behavior uh, of the sediment and biogeochemical processing as the sediment moves into the ocean and only some of which moves into uh, deeper water? So I'm going to uh, emphasize predominantly in this talk, the Amazon Guiana's dispersal system. So the Amazon River, which is shown here, entering the ocean at the equator and a large portion of the sediment brought into the ocean here accumulates in a cliniform uh, uh, delta, proximal delta here, but about 15 to 20% moves up along the coastline as you've heard in a couple of talks already, one by uh, Edward Anthony a few weeks ago in the form of uh, shore hugging, uh, hugging mud banks. So I'm gonna talk about this uh, system as such now, uh, the temporal forcing on this uh, system, that is what drives the migration of sediment, what drives many of the features that I'll be talking about later, uh, is shown here seasonally. This is from a, a nice summary by Chuck Nitrauer and Dave DeMaster in the mid 90s, uh, showing the sediment inputs from the Amazon River at the, at the uh, head of this system uh, as uh, seasonally here. You can see how the sediment inputs vary as a function of water inputs. And of course, the shelf system itself is interacting with the coastal currents, the North Brazilian current here shown in its intensity uh, uh, that you can see also changes seasonally. And up here is perhaps one of the most uh, critical aspects of the forcing on this coastline and the uh, impacts uh, on the uh, biogeochemical processes in the sediment is the forcing from the trade winds, which changes intensity seasonally and also direction. You can see here uh, during the early part of the year here, there's intense winds that impact the uh, coastline directly. Sorry, I have to turn off my phone here. God damn it. Now, uh, there's multi-decadal forcing on this coastline as well, as seen here from a 
figure that uh, Roman uh, Walker put together and the analysis that he made of this coastline dynamics as a function of decadal changes in uh, wave forcing. And you can see here the different uh, time bends here. 1950 is in green, uh, 2010 is in the darker red colors. And you can see the migration of the mangrove fringe coastline here along French Guiana as a function of time. And it turns out that the entire coast is uh, oscillating and eroding and moving uh, as a result of wave forcing, trade wind driven wave forcing coupled to the North Atlantic uh, oscillation. So there are many different uh, driving factors on this coastline which help to move sediment from the input portion here at the Amazon. And this is Cabo Orange here and along up to Suriname. Now, I'm gonna use this kind of conceptual diagram that I uh, hope incorporates many of the primary features of this system here to talk about different uh, geochemical and biogeochemical uh, behavior of this system. So here is a plan view of it. The Amazon's bringing in water and sediment, fresh water. Uh, we have a proximal delta system, which I'll talk about here, which is a clinoform prograding system as uh, documented by uh, Steve Keel and Chuck Nitrauer and Dave DeMaster and others and Milliman and others. Um, and a large portion of the sediment that's brought by the Amazon stays here. And as I mentioned before, about 15 to 20 percent of it moves up along the coast in these migrating mud banks and eventually ends up in the Orinoco Delta here, another uh, delta system here. Now, along the way, uh, and it's very important to realize this, there's constant exchange with the ocean. There's movement of the products of diagenesis offshore, and there's also entrainment shoreward and exchange, which is constantly mixed in this mobile band, which I'll talk about more in a minute, and a stabilized inner band, which represents mangrove systems here. So there's a residence time of sediment in the stabilized band. It exchanges with the mobile band, which is the migrating mud or mobile mud, and that's constantly moving uh, these 1,600 kilometers from the Amazon mouth to the Orinoco. So um, now if we look in cross-section at the del delta, the clinoform, prograding clinoform part of this system off the Amazon River, this is a schematic diagram of really critical uh, diagenetic regimes associated with the different sedimentary facies as we go from the shore off to the shelf break out here. And of course, it, this is schematic and it's meant to show a clinoform in cross section prograding outward. So we have four set beds here that are inhabited uh, by macrofauna and bioturbated. That's what this little schematic picture here is meant to show that we have bioturbated sediments dominating out here in the four set. And this of course is where much of the sediment accumulation, uh, permanent accumulation takes place. Then there's this broad top set region, which is highly energetic, and it's characterized by mobile muds, fluid muds, as uh, Gail Konecki and Dick Sternberg uh, documented so nicely in the case of the Amazon. And then we have in the channels and uh, near shore, we'll have some sandy areas. There's a corridor of sand that is characterized by relatively low sedimentation rates and uh, advective movement of pore fluids through the deposits. And then of course we have a stable or semi-stable, I guess, a shore line, which is mangrove uh, forest. So I wanna make it clear that a lot of the action in the system is on the top set because of the intense reworking of the sediment. And it's bringing shoreward as a result of upwelling and uh, estuarine circulation here, biogenic debris which is formed here in the productive surface water. So there's a constant in, uh, inshore movement of reactive biogenic debris and an offshore movement of lithogenic material that's mixed up in this top set bed reactor system. And this is where geochemically a lot of the action is as I hope to show you. Now spatially, if we look at the, what is the extent of some of these diagenetic uh, regions, and this is derived largely from Steve Keel's work and also Gail's and uh, Dick's 
work on fluid muds. We have huge expanses, about 50,000 square kilometers of the shelf is dominated by these fluid mud systems and mobile mud systems here. And these areas lack macrofauna, as I'll show you in a minute. So there, there's virtually no bioturbation in this area of the shelf deposits uh, to consider. It's a physically dominated area. And at this band out here in the foreset region is where we start to pick up what many of us might think of as more familiar types of bioturbated deposits. And even in the face of all this uh, deposition and reworking and physical activity, there can be regions that are scoured and uh, erosional and we can expose deeper deposits here. So there are some, it, we can get some highly unsteady patterns of uh, sediment compositions as I'll show you. So uh, the depth of the reworking, the depth of this mud, mobile mud is shown here. Again, from Steve Keel's uh, early work on this system. Uh, showing uh, the thickness of this uh, homogenized lead to 10 layer that characterizes this region here. And so these are contours showing thickness of that layer. And you can see uh, one and a half meters, a meter, 50 uh, centimeters or so is, is not at all unusual. So really thick mobile reworking under oxygenated water conditions. The water, the overlying water throughout the system is well oxygenated. And that's a critical characteristic, reworking of, of sediments in an oxygenated uh, setting. Now in plan view, uh, if we look at this kind of uh, clinoform system here, and this is actually meant, uh, this was originally drawn for the Gulf of Papua, which has a very similar uh, proximal uh, clinoform delta character to it. And we have our mangroves here and channels into the mangroves that are exchanging water. We have the movement of the river inputs, sediment and water offshore. We have these broad top shelf, uh, top set regions here that are, are, that are highly energetic and reworked here and that characterize much of the aerial extent of the system. We have a uh, four set region which represents the big storage center for these kinds of systems. And then a bottom set which is uh, rep going to receive the clinoforms at a later point. Now, this top set region in all the areas that I'm going to talk about is dominated by microbes rather than macrofauna, as I mentioned earlier, and I consider it uh, a microbial reactor. Now, one of the critical things I want to keep emphasizing here is there's shoreward movement. We tend to concentrate on these arrows that are moving offshore, as I mentioned earlier. We tend to concentrate on the progression from input to sinks offshore. But in fact, there's this constant shoreward movement of material, which is absolutely critical for the biogeochemical behavior of the top set. And so this is just to illustrate to you that, in, that the uh, bacterial biomass dominates the, these mobile mud areas of these delta systems. And so the red is microbial biomass and the blue is macrofaunal biomass. And you can see that for the uh, Amazon and Guiana systems where we have that intensely mixed lead to 10 layer, we lack macrofauna, we have abundant bacteria. And here's the Gulf of Papua over here. And it has this similar characteristic dominant on the top set of uh, microbial biomass over macrofaunal biomass. In contrast, if we go here to a temperate margin, for example, uh, like Cape Hatteras region, you can see uh, the macrofaunal biomass becomes uh, the dominant form of biomass at any given time. So it's a, these, these intensely mixed fluid mud, mobile mud regions are quite distinctive from bioturbated areas that we're perhaps more familiar with. Now, one of the things that characterizes tropical uh, systems like I'm talking about today is that they receive from uh, the, the continent as part of the characteristic of the material brought in a very iron rich uh, sediment material. So this represents highly reactive iron uh, from an operational leach technique that uh, many people use to characterize iron phases in sediment. And you can see immediately that the temperate uh, zone areas like Cape Hatteras here, for instance, or the Eel Delta on the west coast of the United States or the Mississippi Delta here uh, along the Gulf Coast, they have about one half to sometimes a third of the 
reactive iron, typically input as iron oxide, as do these tropical systems, which come in highly biased and enriched toward a uh, iron rich material. So actually this quantity of iron together with the quantity of labile carbon determines redox reaction uh, at, and the response of redox reactions to physical dynamics, such as the reworking of the seabed. So here's an expression of this iron richness and also of the reworking process uh, off of French Guiana in what I refer to as the, the mobile band. And so you can see the light colored sediment, in this case, uh, uh, 95 centimeters in, uh, in, in extent. And uh, down here, the unconformity of this mobile layer on underlying uh, anoxic sediment. And this is quite distinctive and quite representative of these tropical systems I'm referring to where we get that deeply mixed layer. And here's an example from the Gulf of Papua top set. It's less dramatic in the sense that the unconformity here is only about 30 centimeters from the sediment water interface at the time this core was taken. And uh, we know from thorium-234 measurements of the sediment here that uh, this layer was, in, was uh, reworked and uh, exposed to oxygen just a few weeks before the core was taken. This is from 14 meters of water. And here is uh, the Gulf of Papua, just to give you the, uh, since I've been talking about the Amazon, here is a plan view of the Gulf of Papua, the Fly River here on the uh, west and going over the Perari. There's a prograde inclinoform moving out from the shoreline here that represents the combined, uh, the combination of the material brought by all these rivers into the Gulf. And here are bathymetric profiles uh, through the Gulf going from the shoreline here on G, the G transect, or the shoreline here on the H transect, and you can see the, clino, the characteristic clinoform bathymetry off this system. So I'll talk about a, a little bit more about the behavior of sediment in this area and, and the diagenetic reactions, but I'm going to concentrate because of the time limits on the Amazon. So one of the things that characterizes these mobile layers is that the redox reaction patterns that we're used to seeing uh, in, in a global distribution, uh, which we might normally think of as a progression from oxic sediment to suboxic sediment to sulfitic sediment to methanic sediment with time and depth. So uh, in, a, in an estuary, for example, like Long Island Sound, this zone might be uh, a few millimeters in thickness and in the uh, deep sea, the Pacific, for example, it, it will be tens of meters in extent. But there is this idea that we have a progression. In fact, there's the overall theory. There's a progression of these diagenetic reaction zones that are characterized by particular oxidants. And so you see iron here uh, as an oxidant that's used in the suboxic zone in this, in this stratigraphy or succession of redox reactions. Now, in contrast to this vertical dominated stratigraphy that sort of characterizes much of the world, these mobile areas, these top set areas are characterized by this kind of pattern where we have a mobile sediment like a lead 210 mixed layer or could be thorium 234. And that layer is oxidized when it's reworked. It, oxygen's inter, uh, introduced into the sediment. It will then progress if it's not mixed constantly every few minutes or hours, it will progress through these set of redox reactions uh, and eventually end up here with sulfitic sediment at some time after disturbance or mixing. Now, in the case of these tropical systems, we have a, a greatly enhanced amount of iron oxide in the sediment from the weathering processes on land. So during this progression of redox reactions, this iron-based uh, diagenetic condition is extended for a long period of time, many months. And on the Amazon, you can calculate that the iron, uh, the suboxic reaction uh, conditions in the sediment can be sustained if the sediment's reworked about every six to 12 months. And so, and it certainly is quite uh, commonly done. So we, every time we look 
at sediment in the top set bed, it looks like it's dominated by iron and suboxic diagenesis. And so here, all along this coastline, all along that active or mobile band I, I described in the schematic earlier, if we go into the sediment and look vertically in it, it has these very thick zones of sediment that are dominated by a high dissolved iron uh, in the pore waters and, uh, and they're sustained for extensive depths. So you would think if you were looking at this and, uh, and you were an expert or knowledgeable of diagenesis, uh, diagenetic patterns, you would think that there's very little reactive carbon in the sediment to cause the iron to be reduced. And, and it, so it's sustained for a long time, just like the middle of the Pacific deposits might be. So we have the dominance of suboxic iron-based uh, diagenetic reactions along this entire coastline from the Amazon, proximal Amazon Delta to the Amapah coast where we first start to pick up uh, then the northern part, the mud banks forming and accreting against the coastline to French Guiana where we have active mud bank migration. So uh, to, some, uh, to this point, the energetic top sets behave as a suboxic batch reactors there's the extensive uh, dominance of reactive iron uh, reduction and, uh, and oxidation of carbon through iron-based pathways. And this is, uh, reflects not only the, uh, the physical reworking of the sediment and re-exposure to oxygen, but also the initial input of uh, iron-enriched material. Now, I want to address some of the uh, evidence for how these sediments are interacting with the Atlantic and how the reactions in them depend on those interactions. And so I guess Dave, Dave will be discussing this more uh, next week in more detail, but I wanna make some broad conclusions about it. We have uh, evidence of extensive cross shelf exchange all along the mud belt and, and the, uh, the, first of all, the proximal delta and then the entire mud belt. So we have shoreward transport that's indicated by radiochemical inventories, for example, lead 210, radiochemical activities themselves, again, of lead 210. We can pick out cosinodiscus, diatom, frustrals from mud bank deposits. These are, uh, this is a species of diatoms, which is abundant well offshore and is not normally characteristic of the water overlying the mud banks themselves, but you can find the diatom frustrals in mud bank deposits. So it shows you that biogenic silica is being transported from offshore inshore. And there's also uh, cosmogenic 32 silica, which I'll uh, talk about later. The fact that the cosmogenic silicon 32 can accumulate in the shore face deposits is evidence of shoreward movement carried in the frustules of things like cosinodiscus. Also, there's seaward transport in a quantitative sense indicated by the radium isotopes. I won't get into that here today. I, presumably Dave will extensively that show the offshore movement of radium generated in these disturbed sediments. And we have uh, productivity and supply patterns, which I will show you in a minute that uh, directly demonstrate seaward transport. And we also have led to 10 patterns in the shore face itself showing how the mud banks are migrating and accreting. So um, here's some just some visually evidence, uh, visual evidence of the shelf exchange processes. Here's the Amazon River here, moving up here, Cabo Caspare, Cabo Orange here, and then uh, uh, French Guiana coastline beginning here. And you can see in the real color image here, the muddy turbid sediment that represents the resuspension and movement offshore or onshore in some cases of uh, bottom material and the green water, the green band of water showing the intense productivity that characterizes the boundary here in this system. And you can see the shoreward movement, the eddies, onshore eddies of this biogenic debris and the chlorophyll rich waters into the turbid waters here. So it's, it's visual evidence of that transport. You can see the same thing here, but over a, a longer extent of the coastline, again, showing this entire 
muddy system is highly productive and characterized by inshore movement. You can see these eddies of chlorophyll, which chlorophyll rich water coming all the way to the shoreline uh, in this image. And you can also see here, here's the Amazon in this CWIFS uh, uh, satellite image, you can see the high productivity that characterizes coastline and also the offshore movement and export of some of the uh, nutrients and iron rich pore water injections into the surface water of the Atlantic, enhancing productivity uh, well offshore. I'm sure Dave will get into this. I don't want to steal his thunder, but I but uh, one of the great indications of sustained movement on shore here in this system is the lead to 10 inventory found in the sediment, which shows massively increased inventories along the shelf break, extending well inshore here. This, these are contours of inventory patterns, and they greatly exceed both the atmospheric input of lead 210 and the riverine input of lead 210. So this represents lead 210 upwelling and moving shoreward in this system. So my main point here is that uh, this shoreward movement of reactive material in addition to the offshore movement of lithogenic material from the river. And these are surface activities of lead 210. And, and you can see it's just remarkable. They're virtually all the same in the surface sediment, meaning that the sediment is highly homogenized at the surface all across the shelf, despite this movement of lead on shore here from upwelled lead to 10 rich waters, the entire shelf is characterized by virtually the same surface activity, except way down here, there's some places here in the delta, proximal delta, where we have more dilution of this signal. But look, the entire coast is about two DPM or 2.5 DPM per gram. So this is incredibly homogenized across shelf and along shelf. And part of the reflection of that upshore, that onshore movement here is reflected in the uh, carbon 13 values we find in the uh, total organic carbon in the sediment. And this is from a, uh, one of the nicest papers about the distribution of carbon isotopes in the sediment by uh, Bill Showers and uh, Engel here uh, from the mid 80s. And you can see the dominance of, of uh, enriched plankton, marine phytoplankton signal here as we move into the four set region of the clinoform. And on the top set, a dominance of terrestrial carbon in the sediment and the gradients of marine to terrestrial in here. Now, there's always marine moving in here, as I just tried to argue for, in the bottom water and the upwell, but it's nevertheless, this top set region is dominated by terrestrial carbon. And actually, that reflects the burn off of this labile marine carbon. Even though it's always coming into the system, it's intensely burned off in this highly mobile and oxidized top set region. And so the remineralization rates in this system are actually quite high in the sediments, even though they're light in color, they look like they could come from the Pacific Ocean in terms of their open Pacific Ocean in terms of their iron oxide enrichments. But if we actually measure the carbon remineralization rates in the sediment, and these are from the top 10 centimeters only of the deposits in the Amazon Delta system, the Amapá coast and French Guiana, if we look only in the top 10 centimeters of the sediment alone, the uh, integrated carbon remineralization is as high or higher than any kind of uh, reactive estuarine sediment that we might look at. For example, this flux, this integrated flux of carbon remineralization here measured along the Amapá coast is much higher than what you'd find in Long Island Sound, for instance, right here near uh, New York City. So these are really high remineralization rates in a highly, in a just a thin layer, relatively thin layer of sediment uh, alone. And I'll show you in a minute that these high rates extend uh, through much of the reworked uh, zone. So we have extremely high remineralization of carbon in this system with little evidence of it in the sediment in terms of diagenetic reactions. 
So let me talk a little bit about the, the mud coastline region, the along shelf transport. And this is a, a picture that uh, Edward Anthony showed a couple weeks ago. It's a really a wonderful picture showing the mangrove facies here that characterizes these mud banks, uh, the offshore uh, mobile uh, facies here in these systems. And so the sediment's moving from right to left here in this picture. And it also illustrates the exposure of many kilometers of mud directly to sunlight. So uh, photochemical reactions in the surface sediments are really, really uh, important in the system and can be coupled to the iron chemistry. I won't get into that here, but uh, uh, other than saying that the photochemical reactions and the uh, enhanced iron uh, chemistry under those conditions is a key player in the remineralization uh, of carbon along this coastline. So here's an idealized plan view uh, of a mud bank. And this is from uh, Allison, Mead Allison and Lee's uh, contribution in 2004. And Edward Anthony showed some other schematics of such mud wave uh, systems. But the main point here is that the facies represented, the diagenetic facies represented in these systems consist of an outer mobile band here, characterized by intense reworking and mobile mud layers and fluid muds on the leading edge and on the trailing edge here where erosion is taking place. There are intertidal algal flats facies in the, these mud banks as it's stabilized, becomes part of the stabilized band. Uh, for 10 or 20, 30 years. And then we have mangrove colonization and mangrove forest growth. So this uh, mud bank is migrating from right to left in this schematic. My point here is this offshore region is highly mobile and a continuous stream of mud. There's a stabilized region here, which is being stabilized by algae and mangroves. So there's a flux of sediment in to the stabilized zone. There's a flux of sediment out uh, as it's eroded into the mobile zone. So um, Mead, Allison, and Lee also looked at lead 210 in these areas. And the outer mobile band of these mud banks tends to be uh, characterized by high lead 210. And the inner stable band, the one that's uh, stabilized by mangroves because mangroves forests, has lower lead to 10 activity. So the difference in activity from here to here gives you a sense of how long the sediment is stabilized for. It's, it's roughly a half-life of lead to 10. So we're constantly eroding this material, bringing it back here, and plastering this material into a system that's stabilized for 20 or 30 years. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the carbon remineralization rates in these uh, light colored sediment, and you look at their patterns with depth, they can be have elevated carbon remineralization in them to uh, throughout the thickness of a reworked zone. So basically the thickness of oxidized sediment as you look at it is characterized by very high remineralization rates. In this case, a flux of carbon which is two, over 200 millimoles per meter squared per day, just in this top uh, 70 centimeters of this uh, mobile layer. And that's a huge, huge remineralization rate. As I mentioned earlier, a remineralization rate in Long Island Sound, for instance, might be 20. So uh, these are really elevated values. It's in training, the sediment's in training, lots of labile carbon, remineralizing it through an iron-based pathway and uh, burning it off. Where there's a thinner layer of oxidized and mobile sediment, the integrated remineralization rate is less. Now throughout these mud bank faces, you, you can sample these easily so you can see the pattern of change, the transient pattern of diagenetic ingrowth in a batch reactor type system like these mud deposits are. So here in one place on the uh, Cinemarie mud bank, in, uh, in this case, 1998, uh, you can see the high iron in the pore water down throughout the mixed layer down to 80 centimeters depth. In another site from the same mud bank, you see low iron and high manganese in the pore water. So we're earlier in the sequence, in the batch uh, sequence of diagenetic reactions in this uh, progression from uh, 
denitrification to manganese uh, iron product iron production to eventually if the idea would be that if we come back at a different time uh, on this same site on the mud bank this iron would now be higher like this so all through this mud bank there are different stages of diagenetic reaction in growth in the stabilized regions of the of these uh, systems uh, if we go from offshore in the mobile band here and go to the inshore stabilized phases and we look at something like sulfate you can see uh, in the stable phases sulfitic redox conditions characterize the sediment so this is a more classic kind of pattern we might expect in a steadily accreting deposit. So this transition from the offshore iron dominated uh, remineralization and diagenetic reaction system to an inshore stabilized sulfate reducing sulfitic uh, uh, conditions in the mangrove forest is quite typical of this area. If we look at what's actually driving remineralization in the deposits, what's sustaining those high carbon oxidation states and we look at the isotopic composition of the pore water. Here is CO2 in the pore water, total CO2. You can see it can get extremely high. These are extremely high values of some CO2 uh, in the sediments. This is a parameter that uh, allows us to make a mixing model to tell us from the slope of this line here what the isotopic composition of the carbon that's being remineralized is on the average. And here, you can see in the offshore mobile band off these mud banks, it's a very heavy carbon. This is close to, very close to marine carbon. So even though we're close to mangroves here, when you get a, more than a few hundred meters offshore, the pore waters tell you that the, the carbon substrate supporting remineralization is from phytoplankton, not from terrestrial carbon sources. And the solid sediment tells the same story what's being remineralized in these areas is marine carbon. Now, this is me in, in uh, swamp thing mode, uh, uh, and you can see these waves coming in here toward the shore face, and I'm holding a bucket here of fluid muds, which are coming in uh, as, the, as the waves hit the mud bank. And my point here is to emphasize that all the mud bank phases are eventually blended together as fluid and mobile mud and moved along the coastline. So all those, all the, the properties that are generated in the stable band of the coast are eventually reincorporated into the mobile band and moved. Now, another point I wanna make is that there, there's constant diagenetic fractionation. Uh, this is from the, uh, um, the mud bank that I was just talking about off Santa Maria. Here's the solid isotopic compositions of carbon. You can see the solid phase dominated by light carbon. So there's a lot of terrestrial based, mangrove based carbon uh, in this sediment and it's old. This is the carbon 14 on this uh, axis. It's a couple of thousand years old on the average, but the pore water, the CO2 that's coming out of this old uh, bulk uh, sediment is actually highly fractionated and very uh, enriched in carbon-14, so it's dominated by the marine component, and it's young, excuse me, carbon-13, and it's young from the carbon-14 uh, value, representing in many cases bomb uh, enriched carbon-14. So there's constant diagenetic fractionation, and this is true in every place we've looked. Uh, for example, this is from the Gulf of Papua system with a range of isotopic compositions of bulk carbon, and uh, fractionated carbon in the pore water here, which is heavier and younger. So let me talk about the stabilization time a little bit more and, uh, and, and a little bit more about the carbon, the fate of carbon. So when the bare mud is stabilized on the shoreline, it's rapidly colonized by mangroves and you get pioneer mangroves which grow uh, a meter or two a year. They're very rapid uh, growth here in this system. And we get young mangrove forests in just a couple years. And after four years or more, we can get mangroves that are many uh, meters tall. And at the full extent of growth, we can get 30 uh, meter high mangroves 
and then eventually um, these are eroded away. So here you can see a gradient of stabilization and colonization from exposed algal flat area here to pioneer mangroves. And eventually I said, uh, and, and uh, Edward showed this a few weeks ago, this forest is eroded on the backside of these mud banks and this, all this light carbon, young light carbon is entrained into the mobile band. But if you go more than 100 meters offshore or so from this, you see no evidence of this terrestrial input. It's all the marine dominated material. Oops. Um, so one of the things that happens along this system, again, shown here by this mixing model uh, depiction is that uh, carbon comes in at the, at the proximal delta and moves along the coastline here toward French Guiana. And this represents the loading, the carbon loading per surface area in this sediment, starting with about 0.7 here, the Amazon River, milligrams of carbon per meter squared. And by the time it gets to French Guiana, uh, we burned off a lot of that sediment. And the slope of this line tells you what most of the carbon that has been lost from the solid phase it's what its isotopic composition is in terms of carbon 13. And so this is telling you that as we move along, we're losing terrestrial carbon preferentially from the sediment. Okay. And what that reflects as well is the fact that this labile carbon, which is marine and entrained into the system all along the way, it's burned off. It never enters the solid phase. And so uh, it's not stored very effectively there. We're, and we're also burning this more refractory terrestrial uh, material. Now I wanted to point out here, this is very interesting, that uh, at low stand, this is from the Amazon fan, at low stand, the values plot right on this mixing curve, but at a much higher loading rate. In other words, this shows you how moving along this system and remaining in this highly oxidized band, how it what its effect is on the overall storage of carbon. So I refer to these regions, these uh, mobile bands as uh, incineration zones. They're incinerating a lot of refractory carbon and uh, burning off the entrained labile carbon. So these delta top set and mud waves represent global uh, regions of importance. This enhanced uh, mineralizations promoted by the periodic exposure to oxygen. So increased oxygen exposure time, uh, regeneration of high order oxidants like iron. So ferrous irons reoxidized to ferric. It promotes fenton reaction pathways, which I didn't get into, but these are iron uh, coupled pathways that produce radicals, uh, hydroxyl radicals in solution and are very effective at uh, remineralizing carbon. We oscillate through multiple redox stages, sulfide, back to iron, back to oxygen, and so on during remobilization. We prime the sediment constantly with labile organic carbon entrained in it, which further enhances the remineralization of reactive carbon, of refractory carbon. And we flush metabolites from the system, not allowing them to build up and uh, promoting in, enhanced microbial activity. So on a plot of accumulation rate versus sediment, of sediment versus the percent of carbon that's uh, remineralized in sediment, the percent of what's delivered to the sediment, these systems, these tropical deltaic systems that I've been talking about plot in this region. So they plot in a region of remineralization efficiency that's quite comparable to deep sea areas. And in contrast, small mountainous river systems which are highly, uh, which accumulate at a high rate with refractory carbon substrates uh, eroded from the, the, the uh, source regions, they store a large proportion of, of the carbon that's delivered. My point here is that there's a big spectrum of carbon remineralization efficiencies and the kinds of systems like the Amazon or the Gulf of Papua or other areas uh, that are constantly transiting and re-exposed to oxygen and refluxed uh, in the sediment that they are very, very efficient areas. So uh, deltas, despite this efficient 
burn off and incineration of carbon because of the huge accumulation rates in deltaic systems they still are a dominant depot center and storage region of carbon it's just that if it wasn't for this remineralization uh, during transport and uh, disturbance uh, these the column here would be probably way up into this region here so they're very efficient now I want to uh, make a few more points and then spend the last five minutes on uh, reverse weathering as one example of other reactions that occur in these systems of global importance. Um, if we model that area from that transport of carbon from the source along the coastline to a sink in the Orinoco, and we model the transport as a steady movement of our advection of carbon along the coastline and look at what is the system behavior, which I referred to earlier, of burning off of carbon. We come up uh, with a model using those equations that I didn't really explain, but they're transport reaction balance equations, uh, where we start at the, at the uh, mouth of the Amazon and burn off carbon until we get to the um, French Guiana coastline and if we have a first order decomposition of carbon along this transit, the reaction rate that characterizes that decrease in carbon is about 0.006 per year or a half-life of about 120 years in terms of the uh, carbon decomposition rate constant. One of the things that I wanna emphasize here that we seldom have is a measure of how fast is material transit from a source uh, to uh, another area. And so typically people measure accumulation rates of sediment locally, but they seldom measure along shore transport rates or offshore transport rates. And that's the values that we need to model system characteristics of carbon re remineralization. I want to uh, emphasize that the carbon remineralization rate constant that I just gave is for the bulk carbon. And if we can fractionate the carbon in the sediment, and this is an example of it, showing uh, from ramp pyrolysis measurement that there's multiple pools of carbon. And so obviously they decompose at different rates. And the rate I just gave is for the bulk pool of carbon. Now, there are other areas that behave like this, temperate areas, subtropical areas, and there's been some great work uh, done in, now in the uh, East China Sea and the Changjiang and the, the uh, coastal mud belt that characterizes this region. And again, a long shelf uh, remineralization and loss of carbon that characterizes this system is in the same uh, order of magnitude of what I just showed you for the Amazon system. And the same is true of uh, Arctic systems, the input of sediment in the river end member and movement offshore. And as it moves offshore, we lose carbon. And in this case, uh, from the Broder et al. paper, the characteristic remineralization rates about a third of what I just showed you for the Amazon. So the colder temperatures uh, that characterize these regions and probably the difference in substrate gives you a slightly lower remineralization rate. So I want to just now move briefly to uh, the silica story, because this is not all about carbon. It's not all about iron, but there are other components of biogenic debris which are entrained into this system and are processed uh, diagenetically and result in product output. This is a schematic diagram of the silica cycle, the cell sedimentary silica cycle with reactive opal coming into sediments, being dissolved with depth, some of it's stored. I know Dave would argue that uh, the primary storage of this signal is in opal and silica, but I argue that a lot of it is converted into orthogenic clays, green marine clays, and is buried as orthogenic clays. It's very difficult to identify these because of the lithogenic background. But tropical deltas are perfect places for this reaction, the formation of uh, clay minerals. There's abundant iron, as I showed you, and aluminum oxides coming from land. There's a lot of reactive carbon, which I just talked about, that reduces these iron oxides and releases the aluminum to solution. There are suboxic diagenetic conditions, so the iron that is released doesn't all precipitate as sulfide. And there's this huge flux of reactive biogenic silica 
from source regions associated with the nutrient inputs from the river and upwelling of nutrients uh, offshore. And this biogenic silica is entrained back shoreward into these mobile mud areas. In addition to these substrates, we have seawater, which provides an abundance of alkali and alkaline earth uh, com uh, components, and it's just perfect for reverse weathering. And what we see in the Amazon Delta that illustrates this is consumption of things like potassium from seawater with depth. It's used up as shown here by the pore water gradients. And fluoride, another component of clays is, is consumed with depth. Even in the mud belt, active mud belt, uh, excuse me, mud bank regions in the mobile band, there are potassium gradients that are sustained despite the frequent disturbance. So there's tremendous potassium uptake. If we look from the Amazon River downstream uh, away from it and look at the, the potassium content of the sediment versus the reactive silica component of the sediment, there's a progressive increase in potassium, progressive increase in, in, in reactive silica reflecting, and I think in the the interpretation that there's progressive generation of clay along the dispersal system. And if we put diatoms into this oxidized, reworked, iron-rich layer that I described, just put them in and look at what happens to them, and this is from Gulf of Papua incubations, the diatom frustals rapidly get covered with clay minerals. Just a few months. And here in the Gulf of Papua, same kind of thing. In this case, here's lithium gradients into the pore water, fluoride gradients, potassium gradients, and, the, and this is from that site I showed you a picture of earlier. So the point is, this is a general phenomenon of these iron-rich rework systems. Now, Shoyle Rahman, for her dissertation, uh, looked at silicon 32, which has a half-life of about 140 years. It's the cosmogenic. Uh, nuclide, and it's incorporated into biogenic silica. And if it remained in biogenic silica in the sediment, when you leach the sediment, all of that silicon 32 should be found in the biogenic silica operational leach. In fact, it's also found in an orthogenic clay operational leach. And in the case of the Amazon, from her uh, measurements, the silicon 32 uh, is dominantly in an operational leach you would assign to clays, not biogenic silica. So the point is most of this cosmogenic nuclide that's contained in biogenic silica initially is eventually found in orthogenic clays in these deposits. So using the same kind of system level uh, kind of diagenetic model, which instead of down core looks at a long shelf uh, incorporation of biogenic silica and alteration of and generation of clay along this stream and using another transport reaction model to model the silicon 32 content of the sediment. This is what we see as you go from the Amazon along the mud belt, you see an increase in silicon 32 bulk activity along the mud belt. If there were no entrainment along the mud belt of new biogenic silica, this is what the silicon 32 should look like as it moves. In this case, again, at a velocity of three kilometers per year. And so what this means is the system behavior of this dispersal uh, system is such that there's a much greater generation of diagenetic product than you'd ever expect by local diagenetic uh, reaction processes. So uh, there's a whole story here. I don't have time to develop it now because I'm really done uh, with my time, but these a long shelf iron rich systems like the Amazon and uh, presumably other places in the world that we haven't yet studied from this perspective, they're perfect places to generate iron rich clays. We know they generate a lot of, of iron rich and manganese rich carbonates like siderite for instance, and manganon uh, calcite. And they also generate iron sulfides. These are whole stories in themselves. They have unique characteristics that other deposits don't have. For example, 
the sulfur isotopic composition of these iron sulfides extremely heavy. And uh, that's a story in itself. But these system properties have global impacts that go far beyond what they would have if it was just a buildup of sediment and a down core accumulation of products of diagenesis. So I'm summar summarizing here uh, what I want to emphasize about these, these systems, that they have three-dimensional, in fact, four-dimensional, that's time-dependent gradients in the diagenetic reactions and in orthogenic uh, processes, orthogenesis, that a long shelf uh, transport associated with these deltas is incredibly important for their global impact on, on uh, elemental cycling. We need to quantify the rate of lateral transport. It's seldom quantified by anybody. People concentrate on local accumulation of sediment and seldom uh, include in their, their studies the actual exchange of sediment and net transport of sediment along shelf. And we need to consider both the offshore export, that's commonly considered, but we need to consider this on-shelf flux entrainment and processing during this lateral transport. And so uh, I think the future will be coupling sediment transport in a system perspective with diagenetic biogeochemical models to look at the uh, reactions during lateral movement of sediment as well as down core accumulation. And this, this is definitely a requirement for global scale models of these, of elemental cycling associated with these delta systems. So I'm going to end there. I know I've uh, already talked beyond my time a little bit, but not probably as badly as I normally do. Normally do. So let me end there. So, thank you both very much. Before I give the audience, uh, you know, to ask a question, Tom Bianchi have a question and then Regine, but I want to see because people are leaving now. So uh, next Wednesday, Pete Tolling, he will talk about the Vedic current and uh, David Master next Friday, you know, talk about also uh, the Amazon Mekong Yangzi. So uh, uh, please come back. So that will be after election. Please go vote because this is you know, US, this is maybe only one thing at this time, the last four days you can do to change the scenario. Okay, so uh, Tom, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Hey, hey Bob, that was wonderful. It was uh, something that, that's now stored for the record, I think that uh, we can all use uh, in classes and so on. So it was a great talk. Um, so the one thing that's still puzzling to me, I mean, I brought this up a little bit in, in Ed's, Anthony's talk uh, regarding this sort of changing of mangrove to mobile mud, mangrove to mobile mud through the phases over decadal cycle. Um, it seems to me that, you know, what, what I would be interested in would be to sort of look at, at sort of the um, sort of the average loss or, or production of CO2 versus sequestration of CO2 as you sort of change from these high blue carbon sequestering systems to these burning systems. But it seems to me that you're saying that that, that carbon that gets sequestered during the mangrove phase stays below the new mobile mud phase that moves in because it seems like it's just the, the, the marine stuff getting burned. Why isn't that older a mangrove store that has been lost with the invasion of, of the mobile mud getting burned. You see well, what I'm saying? Yeah, it is actually. And I, okay. um, when we, I, what I didn't show you because I already had way too many slides um, was that if you take cores um, right off, like what a hundred meters or 200 meters from where the mangroves are eroding. In fact, the pore water CO2 is about minus 26, minus 27. So the mangrove material is remineralized um, and, but it just doesn't get much farther than that. If you go half a kilometer or a kilometer offshore and you can, you can walk, uh, well, sort of walk, you can get stuck in the mud um, five kilometers offshore and, um, and in those areas, once you get about 500 meters or a kilometer offshore, that's where you pick up 
the dominance of marine marine carbon in the pore waters. But yes, if you go up right up to the first few hundred meters off these eroding mangroves, you find that it is being remineralized. Okay. Does yeah, that it'd, be your... it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see if there could be some sort of model of, you know, sort of a decadal cycle of, of source and sink transitioning with these different phases of mobile mud dominance, mangrove dominance, you know, this, this sort of stepping stone effect that you go uh, to the west. And, and that's kind of what I'm thinking of in sort of picture of the evolution of this. But yeah. anyway, I, that's that's kind of a fascinating thing that I guess I never realized as much until I saw Ed's talk yeah. uh, that I must have missed in reading some of the literature. I, so, I'll finish with that. But one thing I would be remiss mm -hmm. in saying is that we have to make a new movie with you on the cover uh, of sort of the carnivorous uh, incineration zone, Halloween coming up, <laughs> and you trying to dig yourself out of being consumed by a mobile mud. The, the, <laughs> the stress on your face trying to dig yourself out just gave me, this is what happens when you have COVID uh, dementia. But anyway, that I, I just want to finish with that. Uh, new Hollywood series that's coming up. That's great. But I, so Tom, I'll just also comment because um, we we had inshore, offshore uh, patterns in detail of poor water CO2 isotopic compositions, both carbon-14 and carbon-13 in the Gulf of Papua. And uh, as you go toward the mangroves in that system, you pick up remineralization of, of the terrestrial carbon. It is uh, and and it tends to be younger, carbon-14, uh, so that the fresh terrestrial derived carbon, for example, mangroves, is getting uh, remineralized, but it's really remineralized so close to the shore before it gets into the broader topset region uh, that you don't see it isotopically in much of the topset. Okay, Bob, but you had many questions, you had to answer them as short as possible. So uh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, Weijin, Weijin, next. Good morning, Bob. Thank you for a wonderful Hi. and uh, very insight, inspiring talk. Um, I'll make mine short. Uh, um, uh, so, in s some of these mobile systems developed a hypoxia and progressively in the last few decades, Mississippi State, you know, consistent, but uh, Yangtze, the Changjiang system. Uh, getting more serious, like in 2016, they even first time reported a, a noxious. And mm. we can clearly see like in short term during that period, the impact on basic uh, organism, right? But yeah. do you see evidence or expect uh, uh, lasting effect of these events, uh, progressive hypoxia on diagenetic process, on elemental cycle, such as the last you mentioned the, the efficiency of burning terrestrial carbon in the Delta system. Yeah, I have not personally seen that. Um, all the systems that I've worked on in any to any large degree uh, to date or the portions of systems that I've worked on in other places in these tropical areas are all uh, underlying well oxygenated uh, water. And, uh, and that's a critical part of sustaining the iron component of this system. If you uh, have extended periods of hypoxia or low oxygen, you're going to essentially uh, become more and more dominated by uh, iron sulfide formation and, um, and uh, that class of reactions. And you're not gonna get as efficient formation of things like clay. You're not gonna get any kind of, um, of uh, Fenton reaction contributions to the uh, carbon remineralization. You're not going to get um, uh, the exposure to oxygen, which is so critical as well. And so I think uh, if what you're asking, if you have a mobile mud underlying deoxygenated or hypoxic water, are you gonna get the same remineralization patterns? And I would say, no, they're gonna be much lower. So this could be a major change for a system like uh, Changjiang, you know. Uh, if, if, if there are extended periods of, of uh, low oxygen, yes, it would be. I would expect it to be a major change. Thank you.
But what I should also add that one of the things we found out experimentally with looking at redox oscillation is even a brief exposure to oxygen can actually uh, help to sustain uh, efficient burn off of many compounds, at least specific compounds, if not the bulk carbon. So any period of oxygenation will, will, uh, will enhance the oxidation of carbon. But what I would expect is that the mineral, mineral uh, aspect of, the, of what is a diagenetic problem will, product will change substantially. Um, and so you won't get these, I don't think you'd get as much uh, clay formation, for instance, uh, in, a, in a low oxygen system. So next is the your test. Before your test ask a question, I think there's a many old Amazon uh, Amsad folks here. So after this talk series, this driving us to think about we really need to start a new Amsad project. Now <laughs> having all that kind of information, you know, I think maybe we can come out something from this talk series, you know, then if you demonstrate and the chalk and you know meet Allison talk. So we see, okay. Uh, Yachis, go ahead. Hey, Bob, I'm Yachis. I'm a postdoc at Cambridge. Um, I don't think you've ever met, but um, uh, I've actually worked on uh, autogenic clay formation from the perspective of germanium, actually, in germanium isotopes. And um, the results that I got actually agreed really well with Shiley's stuff. So, so, so I agree sort of that it's a, you know, a major process. Um, but my question was whether do you think it could close the you know the sodium and potassium cycles would the fluxes be enough for that do you think because that's really the you know reverse weathering the uh, key to the reverse weathering is the the cation fluxes rather than the silicon flux itself yes um yes i think um with respect to my opinion on it yes i think they can close the potassium cycle i think it's an important component of the lithium cycle i think it's an important component of the fluoride cycle and so um, I, I'm very confident uh, of that. And maybe we'll get to a point where we have too much of a sink, you know, it, it could be like, um, maybe like nitrogen, we'll have a, uh, a, uh, a sink that's a sedimentary sink that exceeds what we think the supply is. But yeah, the answer to your question, the first order answer is I, I'm confident that it can and will when we look more generally at it. The kinds, even though, um, I had a reviewer for a recent proposal say, we, we don't need to know any more about these systems. Uh, you know, what, what, what's one more point? Uh, you know, if we want to study a deltaic system, it doesn't, we don't need any more points. But I totally disagree. I think we, we the, the Amazon, we know a lot about. We know a lot about a few others, but we just don't have that many studies um, in deltaic systems uh, worldwide that I think we, and I, anyway. Yes, the answer to your questions, yes. Okay. That's very That's great. Thanks. Hey, Steve, Steve, are you still there? Steve, yeah, I'm here. Hey, Bob, great talk. Just really quick question. I, I've been thinking about the proximal Amazon uh, Delta and uh, the, the oxidation of marine organic carbon. I mean, it must be, I would guess it's the extreme end member because in thinking about the freshwater input to the shelf and those cross shelf gradients of lead that, that that uh, Dave showed. What's your what's your sense of the magnitude of marine organic carbon oxidation in this system relative to other world deltas? Oh my! <laughs> uh, we need a more delta. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I, I I don't think we. First of all, I don't think we have. Kind of thing, yeah, we don't have this kind of information from too many deltas. I, I you can count them on your on a few fingers actually, um, where we really have constraints uh, on remineralization rates. And so I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, it's big. And I think, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it has historic, uh, historically been a huge uh, impact on ocean carbon cycling. And one of the interesting things to think about with re reflect uh, with respect to um, geologic uh, variation is the low stand character of the oceans versus the higher stand that we have now 
you, you completely at low stand, you basically don't have these kinds of systems operating, um, at least as far as I know. And so presumably the carbon cycle was, and silica cycle and the other cycles we've talked about here are, have, are very different at low stand than they are at high stand because of these kinds of systems. Yeah, so, that's a, that's sorry, I can't really answer your okay. question. Okay. I, I just think it's, you know, thinking about it, it just must be remarkably, a remarkably big number. And, yeah. and so, but I, I also like you appreciate the comment about the low stand, high stand. So um, yeah. I know we're running out of time, so yeah. I should probably move on. Yeah, follow Steve the question, you know, uh, Bob, you show at uh, the river mouth, on the river mouth, the RN reduction is all the way the peak to four to five meters. Yeah. And you made the curve all the way to six to seven meters. Yeah. Where's the RN come from? Is it from the river or from the offshore? It's mostly, I mean, from, the, mostly from the river. Is this, uh, the Steve, is this also an animal member compare the, uh, the, the Gulf of Papa or other system? Why well, this river have so much, why the so deep to four to five meters? Well, the, um, the, um, the quantity of reactive iron in the solid phase, it's brought by the sediment, reflects weathering processes. And in these tropical zones, the weathering is commonly very intense on land. And so there's an enhancement of these reactive iron phases in the sediments to begin with. And then you, you, you put this material in a physical system that's constantly reworked and reoxidized, and that's what sustains these very thick layers. And, yeah, uh, we, we, we need definitely need to compare this one to the strong tide dominated animal sea, the Urawadi. I mean, gosh, uh, you yeah. know, we need, we need that study. Steve, don't give up, push up. Okay. Um, Michael, Michael, are you still there? Mark Sticks, are you still here? Yes, I'm here. Um, actually, first, a, a, a comment on, you know, setting the high stand versus low stand is the, you know, the real low stand is a fairly short time at the end of a long sea level fall that we need to also think about that falling stage as the whole mm -hmm. system prograding, but before it gets close to the shelf edge. Yeah, as, good point. Well. But um, what I want to ask is the Amazon is a, a particularly muddy system in, in the things, you know, how different would things be in a much sandier uh, deltaic system? Hey, that's, that's a, a very good question. And the, actually the Gulf of Papua system is much sandier than the uh, Amazon system. And so there are, um, there are more extended areas where the advection of, uh, through the sands of water plays a, a much bigger role than it does obviously in the mud areas. And those areas have just not been studied to any degree. And I know from, from some of the studies that I'm involved in now with other people who, who work in sands for the most part, that sands are remarkably reactive, just remarkably. Uh, just like a municipal filter, they filter out bio, yeah. biological material. They, they bring in a lot of labile carbon, but it all is entirely burned out of that sand. So we never see much standing carbon in them. And mm -hmm. um, so, it's, this is another answer I'll just have to say. We, as far as I know, we don't know uh, a lot about these sandy faces, and they are all more reactive than than their carbon bulk carbon content would suggest that they should be. But they are highly reactive. They're just uh, very flow through type areas, and they may have more macrofauna living in them as well. Yes, and that's a key, isn't it? That's a that's an indicator. They have so many macrofauna that tells you there's a huge flux of reactive material through them otherwise there wouldn't be animals living there right so this this is somehow why we need a next generation scientist yes yeah <laughs> there's a lot despite what some people think that we know it all there's yeah, a lot good. up for grabs there really yeah, is that that's good so uh anybody dave do you have any questions or any comments or then we can try to wrap up here I, I'm mute unmute. I'm mute. Not yet, not yet, not yet. We cannot hear you. Dave, we cannot hear you, Dave. Dave, Dave. you have to unmute yourself. Oh, <laughs> right. there you go. Don't Sorry. say anything no. nasty, Dave. No, I, I loved it, Bob. It's good to see that 
multifaceted approach and uh, how things fit together. And I enjoyed the whole talk and uh, uh, no comments. And uh, I just kept thinking of uh, taking fluid muds in the lab right after, as soon as you could after collection and then watching the diagenetic processes uh, with pore water chemistry to, to just see if we follow the, you know, the fro frolic sequence uh, as, as we have always thought in geochemical diagenetic studies. Yeah. Well, uh, actually we've done that. Um, and there's uh, some examples in a paper from 2004 on uh, uh, that I wrote with a, with a bunch of people that, um, and, it, and it follows, the fluid muds follow that pattern. But I'll have to admit Great. that those data are hidden in a much larger paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah but but uh yeah i i do want it for those people who work on these coastal i want to keep emphasizing one of the critical things that we don't know in very many systems is how what's the transit time of sediment from introduction to along a system we don't really know the advection rate of particles very well we know it's local accumulation rates uh, usually quite well, uh, but the advection rates we don't know, but, and we need those transit rates. We need residence times of, of material in each of the facies along the transit path. And uh, that's the kind of information we simply don't have as far as I know. And I wanna encourage people who are doing studies of these systems to try to fit those uh, measurements into their scheme. Great. So, Bob, the last thing, you know, uh, because you answer so many questions, but also leave the so many I answer the question for the young generation. So it would be very nice if you could share your PowerPoint, you know, to this community. I don't think you need other turn your promotion so you can share whatever you have. Don't, don't, don't keep it in your folder, OK? <laughs> don't let it sink to the to the sea bottom. Let's share to the young generation and let them start at the starting point move forward. Yes. Great. So uh, thank you very much. And I hope uh, we uh, I see you uh, next week. And hopefully, hopefully we can have a joyful heart to celebrate, uh, you know, next uh, Wednesday and Friday. Let's keep our finger and go to vote. Okay. Uh, yep. Thank you. Very good. Already have.